We choose violence when we do a Linux tier list. And honestly, people get really upset, especially when it's an honest tier list about where you are in your Linux journey. You're gonna learn a lot in this video. I've already filled in the S tier. It's Debian and Arch. Nothing else goes in the S tier. Debian and Arch, when it comes to Linux desktop, are supreme. Nobody can debate this. I just won't accept any other thing. So let's move on from that. Explain the other tiers here. Hopefully you learn a lot. The pointless tier is going to make everybody mad because more than half of these distributions, all 40 or something that we have down here, will probably end up in the pointless tier, which is going to make some folks mad. But I will explain why I put those things in the pointless tier and how possibly some of them can get out of the pointless tier. Uh, let's explain the tiers real fast to break it down. Amazing for new users. These are your noobs, just fresh, coming from like Windows or Mac or some other operating system. They don't know anything about Linux. Typically, this is where I point them. And most people will move on from the amazing tier, but some people will not, and that's okay. So that's what's going to end up here. Best for business, kind of self-explanatory, business distributions. Creative and unique. These are distributions that are kind of around, but they are so unique that nobody really uses them or the real niche but they're, they're unique enough to where they're not just a copy or a fork. The devil tier, this is going to be your big companies that do just silly things, and uh, there's usually a lot of drama around the devil tier. So that's what's going to end up here. I think you already know what's going to end up in there if you've watched many of my past videos. The lightweight tier, this is where you put distros on anything and everything. This could be as small as a, a, a toaster, a Seagate drive I've installed some Linux distributions on, uh, things that almost have no compute power, old netbooks that might be thrown out, that 10 year old laptop sitting in that drawer. Typically the distributions here will end up in those low power devices. And then the pointless tier where most everything will reside. Uh, is just a fork, a copy, um, a slow gimmick, maybe a couple pre-installed programs that you should install yourself on like a Debian or Arch. There's going to be a lot of stuff in here, and I'll, I'll label those as such. Let's get into it, not waste any time. Alma Linux, best for business. Honestly, if I had Rocky's icon, I'd also put Rocky and Alma in here. Oracle would also reside into the best for business. These are one-to-one -one equivalents of Red Hat. Red Hat is the devil. I think we can easily establish that because they destroyed CentOS and made it uh, from downstream to upstream. So CentOS used to be something completely different. Fun fact, CentOS was my very first Linux distribution that I worked with for years professionally, installing stuff. CentOS Stream is not CentOS. CentOS Stream is a bastardized version that Red Hat changed around after they bought them out. Uh, they've recently closed their source code. A lot of drama there. I'm not going to go into it. But that's why these end up in the devil tier. And controversially, Fedora will also end up in here. I actually recommended Fedora this past year. I thought the releases have gotten so much better. And then I was like, maybe maybe that CentOS 8 drama, it's behind us. Maybe Red Hat has changed their ways. And then everything coming out. Uh, Fedora makes it into here, especially this week, with them proposing opt-out uh, telemetry. So Fedora is in the devil tier. Nothing I'd ever recommend using anymore. Everything from Red Hat kind of goes into here. Why we got people mad from the Red Hat crowd? Let's just upset the Ubuntu people. Let's just toss Ubuntu in here. Come on. I'm going to explain this in one word. Apt install Firefox. Actually, that's three words. <laughs> but one command, I should say. And that is why, why does that change it to a snap? What's up, Ubuntu? You've just gone from this uh, great OG, original, noob-friendly distribution to just stay the hell away from it as far as desktop goes. Uh, you'll still see Ubuntu on like, servers, and they do have some kind of business-esque server type thing, but this is Linux desktop we're talking about. Nobody really wants to use Ubuntu anymore, and that's why it makes it into double tier. Next, we got Alpine Linux. Alpine Linux is amazing. It uses, I think, OpenRC, and it's just a, such a great distribution to load up on containers. You see it all the time in containers. It uses an APK package manager, super, super light, and you're going to run into it a lot in the business realm, especially when you're dealing with Docker containers or, or Kubernetes. You're going to run into a lot of uh, Alpine stuff, so really kind of cool. Check it out. I did a 10 minute video over on Titus Tech Talk. You should check out just kind of overviewing a, a quick install and, and configuration of Alpine. 
Uh, Antics. This is a lightweight distro, kind of a really cool one. It boots up really fast, much like Alpine. It uses a kind of a really unique system. Uh, it doesn't use system D. I think it's also like a run it uh, in it system. So it starts up super fast. You can load it up up on anything. It's probably one of my favorite lightweight distros that doesn't get enough love. Love it. Arco Linux. Oh, this is, we're going to start making people mad again. Arco Linux is in the pointless tier. I love their Git. I steal a lot of stuff from Arco. They have so many cool customizations and they do a great job of kind of making a new user feel at home. The problem is it's on Arch. And honestly, if you don't know how to install Arch and you don't know the inner workings of Arch, I don't think you should be in an Arch distribution. It's not to downplay any of the contributions they make. And I like to steal stuff from Arco all the time. It's really kind of cool. But at the same time, I don't think the distribution should exist. Those people, those talented individuals over there should move on and probably just recontribute to to upstream Arch, you know, <laughs> because uh, Arch is what makes this possible. And you could just take the customizations they make and put it into Arch and you better understand it and you'd be less likely to break. So now that we've said that, there's a bunch of distributions we kind of need to toss in here along with it, with that same explanation. Manjaro, pointless. What happens with Manjaro? You're like, wait a second, it has some of the best customization. Titus, noobs can install Manjaro on Arch. Same problem, right? <laughs> the noob will go to the AUR. They will download a bunch of crap and they will break Manjaro. I know, because I did it. <laughs> and honestly, Manjaro itself, even though Philip Mueller, the, the main uh, dev over at Manjaro, is very talented as well, the problem with it is, hell, I remember in 2019, I just did a Pac-Man SYU to upgrade the entire system. It broke because I didn't read the patch notes. And it should have been like a SYYUC or some uh, different kind of upgrade path and because I didn't do it according to that specific patch it, it broke my Manjaro it that shouldn't happen it just shouldn't happen Manjaro shouldn't exist and if you're you need that type of level of exp expertise you shouldn't be using Manjaro you should just use the supreme Arch Linux so that's where that is um now, I think Arctix is kind of a unique one. I, I kind of want to put it in the pointless tier, but I kind of don't. I almost want to put this in the creative unique tier because it's like Arch, but it differs in one way that I was corrected. Originally, I did put it in the pointless tier because I just thought, of, hey, it's just another Arch fork. But it doesn't use System D. So the init system is different and it starts up really, really fast. So if you're really into Arch and you kind of want to change your init system, but kind of want to be have your hand held a little bit, Ardix can be in that creative, unique system, so I'm going to change it from my er earlier designation. Clear Linux is Nest, and I'm going to throw Clear Linux in the uh, creative, unique, because it's a really amazing distribution from Intel, but I would never use it as a desktop. It, it's really fast. If you have an Intel chip, you'll see that it does usually have a little higher performance than many other Linux distributions, but it's weird because the package manager swap D is really hard to work with and uh, you can't really build a whole bunch creating a dev environment in clearly not the not the most fun thing now if you're heavily into using flat pack and you're okay with kind of having that immutable operating system that doesn't change very much it's almost impossible to break clear linux it's unique enough i love how they leverage every single bit of system d they don't even use fs tab for mounting drives they use system d auto mount they changed, they were one of the first distributions really to use system D boot and really leverage all those system D services without adding grub and all these other packages that many other distributions use. So it's unique enough to where I'm like, you know what, I like what they're doing. And clear Linux kind of goes into that creative, unique category for me. Deep in, oh, all right, let's keep going with that. It's pointless. Now, people are like, wait a second, Deepin's a desktop environment. It's amazing. Titus, what are you, what's wrong with your head? I'm like, okay, don't worry. Deepin is an amazing desktop environment. It has some of the best scaling. It's great. But as a distribution, it's kind of pointless. Like, I'd much rather just install Debian and then toss the Deepin desktop environment on top of it. And then I'm not worried about what's going on in the back end with, with Deepin. Same kind of goes with many of these distributions. KDE Neon, people love. 
I know I love KDE. It's a great desktop environment, but as a distribution, KDE Neon is just silly. Like, what is going on? Why do they have apt and then they have another package manager on top of it? I, I get that's your dev environment, but you really want to distribute that to a whole bunch of noobs? No, stay away from KDE Neon. Stay away from Deep In. Stay away from elementary, honestly. If, if we're, we're going down this road, it just it just doesn't doesn't jive with me. So we're going to grab elementary, toss it in here too. There's a lot of desktop environments that are great, but them making a distribution to go along with the desktop environment doesn't make any sense to me. Just go grab a good distro that's a base and then go right here. Because what happens when you start forking off of these, because all three of these are Debian forks, which come from, you know, Ubuntu is a fork of Debian, and then it forks off of Ubuntu into these. That's a fork of a fork. Going all the way to upstream, there's there's many things they do, and then they're like, oh crap, we, we probably should rebase things or, or come back into these and grab these fixes. It just gets messy, and I just don't like that. Like, why wouldn't you just use the OG Debian? I just don't understand it. Debian's gotten so good over the past couple years that I just don't see a purpose to these distributions. I like the contributions, I like the desktop environment, but it's where it kind of falls for me. In that same realm, we got Endeavor and Gruda too. Let's just grab both the Arch base spins. Really cool customizations, huge amount of programs, same same problem as Manjaro. We're gonna kind of leave it there. Farron OS, that's this one. Used to have a really good place years back when you're like your Debian installer was not very good and it looked kind of like crap. It had really good defaults but nowadays it's like why why does it exist same thing gen 2 mm. gen 2 creative and unique nothing needs to be said about this other than gen 2 is great at building your own linux kernel let's say you want to make uh where i would what I like the world to go with gen 2 is kiosks and let's say that menu at your favorite restaurant Seeing like windows, blue screens of death when I'm going into like a big high rise building, I'm like, why is this using windows? <laughs> why isn't it just using like a stripped down version of Linux that will never break? That's where Gen 2 comes in. It, it, you can create it to do one thing and do it amazingly and then it'll never change. And it'll be really minimal and just very secure. So um, Gen 2 is amazing for custom versions where you can de-bloat the Linux kernel, build it yourself, and then have a couple packages that are really easy. Using it as the daily driver, that's really for tryhards and people that just have a lot of time on their hands. So for Gen 2, I just throw it in the creative unique category because of that. Now this one is gonna cause a lot of people to be mad. And originally I was really concerned because when it comes to security and security researchers out there and ethical hackers, Kali Linux, oh man, they, they really love their Kali Linux, but guess what? It's pointless. It's absolutely pointless. They just have a whole bunch of pre-installed programs. Yeah, they have like a, some gimmicks like Windows mode and stuff like that. But really, if you're going into security researching, you need to learn the fundamentals. You need to learn networking. You need to learn uh, the basics of a Linux system. You need to learn all these things and you should be using its upstream of Debian and installing those things specifically you need to use the burp sweep to do stuff or you need to use metasploit to exploit something install it on debian because that's all kali linux is and if you can't install those programs and you can't make those customizations well you're just a script kitty at that point to me <laughs> and i would emphasize this point just by saying all the people were upset about kali linux but truly the the security researchers that uh are really good a lot of them aren't even using kali linux a lot of them, you know, they're just like, I'm kind of lazy. I don't want to customize a version of Debian and they'll just install Parrot. Parrot's actually, I think, better than Kali. It's a little more lightweight, has a lot of the same tool set, but less of the gimmicks, less of the bloat. So a lot of security researchers actually end up on Parrot instead of Kali. So I'm more worried about me saying Parrot's in the pointless tier based on everything I just said. I'd still put them in the pointless tier and that's not good for my own self-preservation because there's many talented people that do use these distributions, but honestly, they probably should just use Debian. <laughs> so that's where I kind of put these ones. They do have really good tool sets, but at the end of the day, it's just pre-installed stuff that you could easily add to a Supreme distro. That's all I'm saying. Next up, 
let's grab something that isn't in the pointless tier because I feel like I've gotten down on on some distros some you just want to give to a new user and this one's gonna make some people mad probably my most controversial pick out of this entire tier list and that's Kubuntu and I think it's because it's a weak spot for me with Kubuntu I really love it for new users it, it's so gentle for the Windows user coming over you should move past Kubuntu but from a KDE perspective I think it has some of the best defaults and you learn some of this stuff but it's not just learning this stuff a lot of it is is learning some of the tool set of the stuff that comes with the distribution and in Kubuntu kind of a kid gloves approach to KDE for a new user and that's why I love it for new users and then people move past it usually but it does have a really good collection of tools something I'd recommend way more than all these other uh, distros I put in the pointless tier so if you like KDE you want to try it for the first time Kubuntu is usually what I recommend even though it's a fork of Ubuntu and I'm not a really big fan of Ubuntu so yeah yeah that's kind of where I put it for amazing for new users I would also put Linux Mint here as well. Linux Mint has both a Debian spin and an Ubuntu spin in it, but it is another really good collection that's a very solid setup for a new user to where I'd say, hey, most new users coming over, or maybe, maybe I set up something like my grandpa or something where I'm like, hey, you just need a web browser, you don't want to get infected, and you just want it to work. I'd throw like Linux Mint on there because it's just so intuitive. There's graphic. Uh, tools for everything really good tool set built in but at the end of the day it's really good for just a new user now for Lubuntu lightweight distro uh, it's it's okay it has a good tool set so if someone not as familiar with Linux that has like a potato tier kind of thing where they just need that super lightweight will run on anything and they'll have you know system D it'll have all the stuff that they're just accustomed to it does use LXQT, which is a little bit different environment, but still pretty cool. MX Linux, you know, I would put this in the amazing for new users realm because it was a Debian fork, but Debian's just gotten so good to where MX Linux used to fill this niche. And anymore, I'm just like, install Debian. Sorry, MX Linux crowd. That was That's rough for me because I really did like MX Linux. It's just, I don't see a point in installing it these days. NixOS, I just did a video on it. It's reproducible builds for Linux. You can install anything, reproduce it really easily, and deploy it to a thousand computers. Obviously, best for business. PC Linux OS is one thing that was kind of interesting. You know, four or five years ago, PC Linux OS would make it into the, like the amazing for new users because they'd use a lot of compatibility. Let's say you had a webcam that didn't work. You could use PC Linux OS and it might work where Debian might not. But these days it hasn't seen many updates in I think several years now. And I just can't recommend it. And it ends up being the pointless tier because everything it used to do real well, Debian does now. So there's no point in it. Peppermint, same thing. You know, lightweight. I would say Peppermint has a little bit better package selection than Ubuntu. That's why it makes it in the lightweight realm for me. I really like it. And for the next one, Pop OS. Oh man, two years ago, it ended up right here. It was an amazing distribution. I've even done a lot of videos and even had like my daughter, my nine year old daughter at the time, install Pop OS. It was great for new users, but it is a fork of Ubuntu using the GNOME desktop environment. And they really haven't evolved yet into another tier. I could totally see this coming back to here, or maybe even right here with the cosmic tool set they're moving on from gtk they just haven't yet and all they have going for it is like an nvidia spin that's good but to me it's pointless right now but as cosmic comes out and it becomes more unique and there's actually more stuff that's just not copies uh, with some tweaks uh, because you know hey pop os back in the day one cool thing it did where like a debian didn't would make it up to here was like it did, uh, I think it was like a U-limit, and you could do F-sync and some other cool things, but all those settings got kind of pushed back into upstream Debian, and there's no real customizations in Pop! OS I miss anymore. So right now it's the pointless tier. However, I know System D has some really talented people over there, and they could move out of the pointless tier. Next up is Puppy Linux. 
uh, it's either lightweight or creative and unique. It's weird. It's a strange distro. It's lightweight. They make custom. It has a strange package manager of like wolf and bark and <laughs> these weird commands. I'm going to put it in the lightweight tier. It could also go to here just because of how it's designed. But um, not something I would use. And I probably should use a little more so I can give a little bit more uh, better feedback. But right now I'm going to just throw it in lightweight tier. Slackware is next, creative and unique. Slackware is the original desktop uh, the Linux distribution, really. It's one of the very first Linux distributions. I want to say it's the oldest active Linux distribution. It's a little bit rough to work with, though. The package manager and, and some of the weirdness to, to Slackware, if you love compiling and building your own program, Slackware is cool. There's a lot of OGs in Slackware. I don't want to say anything bad about it because it is the OG of Linux distributions. It's just not, <laughs> not my cup of tea, but I want to put it there. Next up is Solus, which has like a budgie environment. So it's like its own unique desktop environment. So they're not really copying much. It's not a fork of Debian. It's not a fork of anything really. They create their own kernel. So Solus, it's real niche. There's not a lot of guides on Solus, which makes it hard for new users or even intermediate users to use it. But if you're really familiar with Linux and you love the budgie desktop environment, Solus actually does a really good job of keeping up these things. And honestly, it's, there's no forks. They build all their stuff. So end-to-end -end Solus is kind of an amazing, unique distribution. Next up is going to be SUSE. Well, it, it's in the name, you know. It, it's, it's Enterprise Linux, and it's good for Linux. Uh, businesses using Linux with, a, I think, the entire German government used it for several years. And uh, yeah, it, it's one of those, if you're a business, you need support and you want a desktop, SUSE is probably one of the ones I'd point to. As far as using it for day-to-day -day for a normal user, OpenSUSE is there and it's okay. It has some unique package managers with Zipper. It has a really unique like control panel-esque type thing with Yast, but it's not something... I like because it's just a little too niche. But if I was in a business and I needed a support plan, I'd probably choose SUSE for uh, like workstation environments. Next up is going to be Tails. And Tails is cool. It's obviously creative, unique. It's meant to run off of either a USB or, or CD, and it loads the entire Linux distro into memory. And then once you're done, you basically turn your computer off and everything's gone. So it's really good for like a one-off task that maybe you don't want any remnants of whatever happened there. I think even some governments ban tails because they're they're afraid people use it for malicious purposes and there won't be any way to track what they did. Uh, for me, it's like, eh. I mean, honestly, I wish I had another distribution to th toss in the creative unique Cubes OS, which is Edward Snowden's one, where if you're inter interested in privacy, instead of using like a tails, I'd use Cubes. It teaches compartmentalization. I did a couple videos, an entire series on Cubes, that was really kind of amazing. Check it out if you want. Um, next up, Void Linux. This is another creative and unique one. You have a, a unique on non-system D one. Everything's built. It's not like a fork of a fork. It, it's a really cool distribution in Void. Highly recommend checking it out. I need to do a deeper dive on it, but it's a very unique distribution. And then we have Tiny Core. This one is like obviously the king of lightweight. I think it runs on 20 or 40 megs of memory, something just ridiculously small. So tiny core is kind of cool. And then we've got two more, Zorin and Nubara. Zorin is something where I struggle. It's either the devil, it's either a new user or it's pointless. And those are the, like the three categories where I'd throw Zorin. It has a pro plan where you pay $30 and it's a paid distribution but at the same time i'm like ah but it's really kind of a kind of like chromebook-esque feel to it to where anybody could pick it up and use it and if i was just gonna say a one-off person that needed maybe a support plan zorn's kind of where i'd lean them to if i wasn't the support and i would be like hey just call them and you can you can get some support for it i think zorn would be okay for that me personally it's pointless but I, I don't want to knock it because it might be good for new users. And then I added one more, and that's Nibara. This is a Fedora fork made by Glorious Egg Roll that is made for gaming. Glorious Egg Roll knows Linux gaming better than pretty much anybody. 
And if you need just the best stock default and you just want to game in Linux, Nubara is where you should be. So if you're a, you're a gamer in Windows and you're like, I want to try Linux gaming, Nubara is where you go because everything out of the gate is set. You don't have to know a whole lot about Linux. You can just install Nubara and go. It's it's really a well done distribution, even though I give it kind of a knock these days being based on Fedora, but to be expected because Glorious Egg Roll, who makes it, actually works at Red Hat, so he knows it the best. And he, he does some of the best work out there when it comes to Linux gaming because almost anybody that does Linux gaming knows about Proton GE, which is made by Glorious Egg Roll, which makes Nubara. And he does all these great customizations to make Linux gaming a thing. So this is the Linux tier list. Let me know your hate down in the comments below because I trashed your distribution. Sorry, but I want to say... You get my rationale for each one of these distributions as you've gone through. This gives you kind of an, an idea of why I put things in certain categories. And know that this tier list could look different for you. And know that just because I, I don't want people to choose a distribution because of the look and feel. Because the look and feel can be done on any of these distributions. You can give me any one of these. I can change the desktop environment. I can change, obviously, the background, the icons, the theming, the file managers. All that stuff can be changed you should never pick a distribution based on its look. And I see too many like people that look at Garuda and I'm like, man, I love that neon feel to it. I'm going to do that. Or they'll look at these other ones in the pointless tier and go, well, it just has a good look. I feel like I'm going to move to that. I've even seen people go from like pop to, to Farron to <laughs> Parrot and all these different ones in here. And it's really like all Debian based distributions and not much is changing for them. It's just changing like the look and feel and like, you should have just installed Debian and learned how to change all these things yourself. That would have kept you from distro hopping so much. And that's kind of where I'm at with this tier list, why it's structured the way it is, and hopefully you learn something. And with that, be gentle in the comments. Please, please, just know that's why I did it this way, is just to hopefully educate people in a certain areas over why you choose certain distributions and not to get so overwhelmed with, wow, uh, we could we could have easily, easily added another 50 in here, but most of those would have been in the pointless tier and people's eyes would have just glazed over. So with that, I'll see you in the next one.